Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. It's Thanksgiving weekend as we record this, and we are back talking Flames hockey. Matt, we're two games into the season. How do you feel about the season so far? It was a little bit of a shaky start, but they certainly did come on in the third period yesterday and got the two points, which is the important thing. Well, let's chat about these games. Uh, Let's break down what we've seen so far. So in the home opener, the game that I think we were all expecting that the Flames were going to come out strong and, you know, put on a good showing for the fans, we lost 5-1. to And I have to say, there's a few times I just wanted to turn that game off. Like, I don't know what happened there, but the Flames seemed like they fell apart. Yeah, they were a little uncoordinated, but it's not really all that surprising because this time last year in the home opener against Vancouver, they also struggled quite mightily during that game, and the two goals that they did score were not because of a huge amount of pressure by the Flames, it, they just kind of came out of nowhere and popped one in and that was it. And Vancouver controlled most of that game. So the fact that they started off on the similar footing wasn't really a shock to me. It, it's one of those things that you wish that they were playing top-notch hockey from the get-go, but it it is what it is. It seemed to me like the team was still playing sort of at that 70-80% speed like you see in training camp, and the Vancouver wasn't, and it seemed like we just kind of got, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to say they were faster than us, but that they just came out more ready to play a home opener at you know the regular season level than we did. It didn't help that they were trying to force plays instead of letting them grow by themselves, and like they were throwing passes where last year they would have just held on to the puck and waited for an option to come and that led to a lot of turnovers and it was just a, like a never-ending cycle of frustration all through the night lots of uh lots of penalties there too i was not surprised to see pretty much right when the game started that michael Furlan and derek dorsett yeah, got the, into it the fastest fighting majors in the last 25 years yeah, well, and, and it was funny because as soon as I saw those guys drop their gloves, it reminded me of, what was it, just over a year and a half ago now when we had the line brawl between these two teams, and I was watching going, I wonder if anyone else is going to get in on this. Well, it was good to see some spirited action from both him and Bullig in the first period of that game. Yeah, we had Bullig and Prust fight later in the period, um, so good good to see those guys kind of getting into it and, um, you know, trying to get their teams motivated. Yeah, plus, uh, with how Vancouver's season ended last year, you would have been wouldn't have been surprised to see them wanting to come in and you know get some retribution for what happened last year. So the fact that they lost five to one, it, with all the factors, it, it, the the score didn't really surprise me too much. I have to say I was quite impressed in that game by the uh, Sedin and Sutter line. I've always thought highly of Brandon Sutter, but never really looked at him as a you know first-line guy. And I, I don't doubt that the Sedins are maybe propping him up a bit, but he got two points, and that line together had three goals and six points. And I thought that Sutter was really impressive. Anytime you put somebody that has some skill with the Sedins, you know, they take off. We've seen guys like Burroughs, Anson Carter... You can just go through the years of, you know, second, third line guys that they've put with the Sedins and all three of them just take off. Yeah, and, and that's the interesting thing, too. Is it's one of those things of, is this guy really, you know, a first line caliber player or are they just looking good? Um. So anyway, any any bright spots you thought in that first game for the Flames? I thought Kari Ramo played well, despite giving up the five goals. 44, 44 saves, 39, or 44 shots against, 39 saves, which gives them a save percentage of .886. It, it's one of those things, that when your team is struggling as bad as they are, and giving up the quality of chances that they were, you're going to let goals in. Even if you're, you know, say Dominic Hasek in his prime, that, I don't think he would have saved the game for the Flames there, so. No, he wouldn't have. 
And I think that Ramos got a little bit of an unfair shake because of that. You know, people are already looking, saying, well, um, you know, Ramos, the one that was in net for the 5-1 loss, I guess he's not the number one guy here. And I'm thinking, well, that's not really fair because he didn't have a, a great yeah, team in front of him. small sample size. It's just like in baseball, like if a guy struggles for a month, well, big deal. It doesn't necessarily mean that the guy's a bad player, just having a bad stretch. And the team in front of Ramo was not very good. So even last year, sometimes the games would get away from the Flames and it wasn't the goaltender's fault. And that was what was the case. You know, we'll see if he plays again in the next couple weeks that whether he struggles again then you're getting more of a case to go in a different direction but any one game you can't really tell i did think that we maybe saw the best home opener appearance that we've seen so far from dennis weidman's the flame um to me he was one of the few guys that was noticeable for most of the night for good reasons and in the third period at what was it, about eight minutes he knocked uh burrow's um down he he got the own goal there but uh i don't know you can't really fault him for that i also thought his defense partner chris russell had a good game some good jumps into the play i know people are going to chastise me for saying you can't really fault uh fault him for getting the own goal but he was he was trying you know it's not like he just directed it in or is poorly handled he was trying to knock the puck away and it went in and it's not like it cost us the game when we were down yeah. by that much anyways to, to me, I look at it as, you know what, as long as we learn from it, it doesn't happen again, I'd rather it happen in a game like this, then sometime it's going to cost exactly. us two points. And I don't know if you saw it, but they actually showed uh, Ramo coming over to talk to him later. So I hope Ramo wasn't chewing him out. I hope he was more giving him some confidence. Because you could tell every time they showed Weidman on the bench after that, he just looked really upset with himself. And uh, one last player that I thought played an exceptional game was Brett Kulak. I think he, for somebody that's only played one game in his NHL career, to come in and play a steady 14 minutes, not look out of place at all defensively, and make some smart plays under pressure, I think he afforded himself a net more of an opportunity to see if he can remain in the lineup long term. It's easy to talk about these kind of guys, you know, and what they've done after one game and a small sample. But yeah, I thought that Kulak didn't look like a guy who is a rookie. He perhaps looked better than some of our veterans. I I didn't even notice out there when Kulak was out because he wasn't making some of the mistakes that we'd expect. He was quite a solid player. I I think that pretty much every shift he had, he he did pretty well. And he played uh, 13 minutes, 58 seconds. So, yeah, pretty much 14 minutes, which is a lot of time, too, for you know a guy who is brought up from the farm. I mean, most of the time, that kind of time is reserved for the top yeah, four defensemen. He was a minus one, but that was the first goal when it was a bit of a sloppy line change by the Flames. So I can't really fault him too much on that one because he pretty much just stepped on the ice and then, oh, it's in the net. <laughs> so... Yeah, no, for sure. And I think it shows, too, the coaches and their um, their the confidence they have in him to give him 14 minutes in the home opener. You know, they really want to test this kid out. Maybe they gave him more than they expected once the game got away from them just to get him on the ice. But I think to get 14 minutes uh, when you're kind of the call-up guy, if you will, it really shows the coaches want to see what he's got. So yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and if he continues to play at that kind of a level consistently perhaps he knocks england and smeed out of the lineup and steals a spot because the flames have shown a willingness to give time to guys that like josh juris who have shown something to see if they can continue for sure yeah but i think he's got to stay consistent with what he's doing and it really makes me optimistic because if he i mean you know, coming into the season before training camp, Kulak was probably f- number six, seven, maybe eight on the depth chart as far as, you know, defensemen, depending on who you're asking. But if he's been able to improve this much in, you know, less than a few months, it really makes me optimistic of what's going to happen with the rest of the defensemen and the guys that like Anderson, Shillington, um, you know, those kind of guys who, who we really have high hopes for. And if they can continue that kind of improvement, we're going to have quite a deep defensive core for the next couple of years. And so after that disappointing uh, 
loss, the Flames took a couple days off and they went back to um, Vancouver on Saturday night, last night, and played the Canucks again in a home and home series, and we ended up winning three to two. Uh, Matt, what are your what are your initial thoughts I thought on that game? They had a better effort in the first period. They looked more like how the Flames did in the home opener in the first five minutes, but consistently through the first period. Then they fell back into the same, you know, <laughs> dumpster fire caliber hockey that they played after the first five minutes in the second period before pulling out themselves out of it in the third. Yeah, I mean, they they didn't have a great game. And I mean, the fact that it took overtime to settle it, I think, probably shows you that on the score sheet too. But you're right. I think there was flashes of brilliance at different times. But to me, it still didn't look like the 60-minute effort they're going to need to be a playoff well, team this year. Going back to last year, in the second game, they played against the Edmonton Oilers. And through the first two periods in that contest, they had the same struggles. And I do believe they were tied 2-2 after two. And if it wasn't the for the fact it's the Oilers, you know, the Flames might have found themselves in a similar position. But they did respond well in the third period in that contest and ended up winning 5-2. And if it wasn't for Ryan Miller standing on his head in the third period, the Flames probably would have won that in regulation. Yeah, it very well could have been. Um, yeah, no, I, you know, I think Miller in both these games looked really good. And I know last se- or not last season, when they traded Luongo away, a lot of people were wondering if Miller was a suitable replacement, and I think Miller's been yeah. great for the Canucks. We'll see if that continues, but he has been showing that the Canucks made the right move in trading Eddie Lack instead of Miller. One of the things I think is the big story of the second game of the year was Mason Raymond. I mean, here's a guy who had, who I think has fallen out of favor here, who was waived earlier this week, scratched for the season opener, and in the first period of that game, he had four shots and probably three or four great chances. Like, where's this Mason Raymond been for I the know. past 12 months? And it seems like the second game of the year is a, always a good one for him because he scored a hat trick against Edmonton last year. So uh, I'm hoping that this is just a sign of him breaking out of his funk, whatever his problem has been in the last month during preseason. I'm hoping that waving him gave him the motivation that he's going to come back and say, "Okay, I've got to, you know, I've got to do better here." We know he has the talent to do it. It's just a matter of why he's not. I don't know. It's just one of those things that he's not really seemed too comfortable wearing a Flames jersey, and now he really does need to fight to keep a spot, especially with so many good young players in the organization that he has to realize that if he's not going to outperform the other guys, that his spot's gone. And I mean, really, if you take a look back at Raymond's stats, I mean, you know, he played for the Canucks for, what, one, two, three, uh, a whole handful of years, I think about seven years, and he had one season where he got 53 points, one where he got 39, and otherwise he was just kind of getting 20 points every year. He played for the Leafs for a year, he got 45 points, and last year he got 23 with us. So we know that... If he's motivated, he can get, you know, 40, 50 points a year. But the question is, how do we get him motivated? How do we get that Mason Raymond back? Yeah, and if he continues to keep firing pucks at the net like he did last night, just the nature of averages, some of them will start going in. And in the the second half last season, I found that he was more reticent to actually shoot the puck on net and was more looking for his line mates to fire a pass to so he needs to focus more on being selfish and actually putting those pucks on net instead of looking for other options yeah it'll be interesting to see what happens with him but i think that mason raymond's going to be the guy to watch over the next little bit to see if we can get you know, the 40, 50 point scorer out of Mason again, or if we're destined to get sort of the subpar Mason Raymond, because he's got 30 days to impress this team, or I think he may end up in the AHL. That's the ax that's hanging over his head is that the Flames had no problem sending Devin Setaguchi down last year when he struggled. So if Raymond doesn't 
kick his funk out and start performing like an NHL player, then, you know, in comes, say, Emile Poirier or Marcus Grandland or whomever, and on with the next guy. Yeah, so I think that this is... I think in the past, Mason Raymond's never really had a challenge for his job. Um, I think for a lot of his career, he's just kind of been, you know, a highly paid guy, and it's like, okay, I'm going to have an NHL job somewhere. But I think the fact they've waived him sends a signal to him that, you know what, yeah. you're on the bubble. And the thing is, is that it, he might need that kick in the pants like Kari Romo did last uh, in 2013-2014, where... He, Ramo struggled mightily when the only other goalie was Joey McDonald. And lost his job to Red Obara eventually. And it, perhaps Raymond, seeing that no other team in the NHL wants him, and that if he doesn't put up, he's going to be gone, that maybe he can snap out of it and respond. Hopefully. Um Brett Kulak last night uh, had 16 shifts. Average length of his shift was 36 seconds, and he played a total of 9 minutes, 42 seconds. What do you think of Kulak in Game 2? Uh, he made a brilliant uh, outlet pass to Raymond in the first period that was very reminiscent of TJ Brody. and uh, I thought he was very solid. It's not surprising that the Flames shortened the bench and just basically kept throwing Hamilton and... Giordano and then Weidman Russell out there on consecutive shifts with the other guys getting virtually no minutes as the Flames were trying to come back. Let's talk about Hamilton. Hamilton got his uh, first goal as a Flame uh, five minutes into the first period, uh, assisted by Goudreau and Hoodler. And I don't know about you, but when I looked back at Hamilton in that game and I watched some footage again today, he really looked like a forward. I mean, there's probably two or three times that I saw him, you know, way up at the hash marks and in the middle of the dot, and it was very different to see because we don't have a lot of defensemen well, that play like that. he is such a fast skater and is such a big skater that he can jump into the play and then, like, take, like, three or four strides, and he's right back in his defensive position. So... You know, it, it yeah. affords him the ability to jump into the play, and that's just another dangerous weapon on top of Brody and Giordano who can do that as well. I think if you look at our forward ranks, too, we have guys who, you know, I look at a guy like Froelich or maybe Jones, maybe Juris, who if he does cheat up a little bit, Hamilton, they could always drop back and sort of hold down the blue line in the offensive oh, zone. Oh, for sure. And that's part of the thing the Flames have been teaching most of their wingers. Like, I even saw Gaudreau dive back to the point when I think it was Weidman was pinching up. So it's good that the Flames are focused on the details so as to not allow odd man rushes the other way, even if it is a forward that's back. Yeah, and that gives us a lot more options, and it it keeps the other teams on their toes too. Because you know, if they if they don't know who's doing what or where Hamilton's going to be, it's harder to uh, you know harder to shut us down. On the defensive side, Hamilton's been a little off the first couple of games. He's which is still, understandable. Yeah, he's still adjusting to. Oh, I have to be here instead of here. Versus, you know, being in the Boston system, they do things just a little bit differently. So he has to figure out, oh, I'm supposed to be here in this situation instead of playing it this way and all that fun stuff. So, but that usually takes 10 or so games to iron out the, all yeah, the details. Yeah, and I'm not worried about Hamilton. I mean, we know he's going to come around. He's not a guy that we have to be worried about. It's just a matter of coming to a new city, working with a new coach, having a new partner, and just, you know, getting comfortable in that scenario. But, you know, he's not a guy that I think we have to be worried about. He will hit his form here by, I'd say, probably end of next week. Oh, yeah. The latest, like, the end of the month. And even if he is kind of at 70 or 80%, if you will, because he's not, you know, firing all cylinders, he's still one of the best defensemen on the ice. Oh, yeah, for sure. I still can't believe the Flames got him for what he, they did, but... that That's why we pay the GM the big bucks, right? Um, did just want to congratulate Jared McCann of the Canucks. He got his first uh, NHL goal in the second period of the second game this year. 
So good for him. It's always nice to see a guy, you know, breaking in and getting a goal. Yeah, especially with his parents being there. Yeah, and it, and it's done at home, and it's you know it's always more special when you when you score that first goal in your own barn. Yeah, plus it's always one of those things that the Flames like doing is surrendering milestone goals for players, whether it's Messier or Sundin's 500th goal or a whole lit, whole host of players' first NHL goals. You know, we're accommodating that way. There you go. Calgary's a happy place. Everyone loves Calgarians. We're a friendly bunch. You need a first goal? We'll help you out with that. You need a milestone? Just wait. wait. We're coming to town in a couple weeks. Just hold off. We'll help you out there. Uh, what would you think of the Monaghan goal in the third period? Excellent play by Gaudreau in the corner. He was looking like he was going to get nailed by Hamus and ducked the play entirely and... Gaudreau being Gaudreau, he found Monaghan standing right in front of the I'm net all by himself. I'm glad to see the Flames really haven't touched that monaghan hoodler Goudreau line. We saw such great chemistry there last year, and it's nice to see that those three can kind of pick up where they left off. There hasn't been any... I don't think there's been any adjustment there. And that goal, I think, was finally just a point of us wearing down uh, Miller. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Uh, you got to figure that when you have players that are that talented, it's just a matter of time. It's sort of like having the Sedins out there. Uh, you know, they're going to get their points. And it's just a matter of at what point in the game are you going to get screwed by them. Yeah, I guess it's a, that's a an interesting way of looking at it. But yeah, I think you're right. You know that at some point they're going to get to you. It's just a matter of holding them off for as long as possible. So we got to see our first official, if you will, three-on-three overtime. We saw some looks of it, at it during the preseason from various teams, but the Flames and the Canucks made it to three-on-three overtime. Matt, what are your initial thoughts after our first look? I thought that the Flames coached it appropriately and played very tentatively in the three-on-three. And I think that's going to be the thing that will eventually be taught by all the teams is just keep a hold of the puck for as long as possible face-offs i do believe will be the most important thing in the three-on-three overtime because any team that controls the puck that we saw like the last two minutes of overtime where the flames just held on to it instead of like dumping the puck in and chasing it they were just holding on to it Yeah, it really became a possession game in that overtime for the flames they just wanted to have the puck on their sticks as much as they could yeah because eventually the other team will take a step this way and put them out of position and you know that's that and we saw that on the goal where weidman looked like he was about to turn it over two guys jumped up Weidman got the puck and fed it back to Gaudreau and then there you go you've got Gaudreau and Hoodler all by themselves with one guy between them well they're not gonna miss and I agree with you about the face-offs I think face-offs are gonna become more and more important and I wouldn't be surprised as we see teams kind of figuring out how three-on-threes work best for them if we see more bottom six centermen playing the three-on-three because often you'll see the bottom six centermen have Sun's the higher face-off win percentages, so I wouldn't be surprised if every team kind of has that face-off guy who is their three-on-three centerman. Well, we even saw that last night in the defensive zone uh, when the Flames took a face-off. Matt Stajan was actually out yeah. there and won the draw. So, yeah, I could see it where, like, if it's an important face-off like that, you'll see a guy like Stajan out there win the draw and then, like, run to the bench once possession is guaranteed type of thing, and switch off with whomever, whether it's Gaudreau, Monaghan, whatever. I think when I think of 3-3 three three overtime, I probably echo the sentiments of Brian Burke that I'm not a huge fan of it, but anything's better than the shootout. Um, I've never been a fan of the shootout. I've been very vocal about that in the past. But I don't think 3-3 three on three is necessarily a solution, but if that's what it takes to get us you know, more games contested as a team instead of as individuals then i'll take it yeah honestly i have no problem with 60 minutes and then i I don't understand why we can't tie i mean sometimes the teams are equally as good 
and to, and to me, I know they got rid of it to get rid of the to make rivalries more important. They said, but there's something to be said back in the day when we could tie of having you know you play your rivalry and you tie twice during the season, and then it's a matter of who can actually break the stalemate. You know, the artificiality of the loser points helps to like foster more tight playoff races, which is annoying. Because, you know, some teams are just terrible and they have no right being in it. Like, say, like, the LA Kings last year, I think they had, like, 12 or 13 loser points. And they should have been out of it well before April even started. But yet we're in it right till the last day. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And I I don't know that 3-on-3 is going to be the final solution. But I think as we see it, played out this year and we see the GMs and the coaches opinions on it and how it evolves I think we might end up seeing a four on four for half three on three on half I know they've tried some of that but I like that it's being contested now as a team as opposed to you know kind of just the shootout yeah it is a step in the right direction but I think a five minute four on four then like blowing it dead and then starting over with a three on three would be the best way to go about it. And then a shootout after, if you're going to continue without ties. I agree. So, we'll see how it evolves, but I was, I didn't really, I thought it was interesting seeing it for the first time, but it's not something I hope that we see a lot of this year. I'm hoping we can get the job done in 60 minutes more often than not. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's too much... (sighs) sloppy play entirely like it's too loose well, to and me free it's flowing. just the game is a it's a five on five game i mean you play five players and to me i don't understand why we would contest anything other than five on five action maybe four on four but like why do we just arbitrarily take two guys off the ice and say let's keep going i know it it's a little too artificial but we'll see adjustments will always be made and they try it, and if it's a success, then they'll keep it. If not, they'll make more adjustments next year. So after the first two games, we've seen both of the Flames veteran goalies uh, starting at now. We saw Ramo in the first game and Hiller in the second game. Matt, based on what you've seen of both of them, um, if you had to keep one of them or potentially dangle one on the trade block right now, which of them do you think you'd hang on to? I said before the season started that I'd probably keep Hiller just due to the different style between Ordeo and him. And even though Ramo didn't play poorly, I would have to continue saying that just because I I still like the idea of having contrasting styles of the goaltenders. Even though both of them played well, it's a real tough decision because you have three goaltenders that are all really good and you you can only keep two of them. It, it would really depend on what you're getting offered. Like if you're getting, say, an offer of a fifth round pick for Kari Ramo and like a third plus a good prospect for Hiller, you'd probably say, well, you know, Hiller might be slightly better, but... Well, that's what we, that's what we talked about last week was that it's going to depend on uh, you know, what we can get. I think both goalies are probably in play as far as um, trades go, and it's just going to be a matter of who you can get more from. The interesting thing that I think happened over the last week since we talked last was that it looks like we finally have a team who needs a goaltender. Um, we were sitting here last week saying, I wonder who might take him. I wonder who kind of might... Um, you know, might decide they want a backup or a 1B guy. And now we've got Buffalo with Robin Lehner out. Uh, and he it looks like he's out long-term. Do you know how long he's out for? Uh, six to ten weeks. And it's probably going to be more the ten weeks so than four the to, six. Really, two to three months almost. Um, you look at Buffalo then, they have Chad Johnson and they've called up Nathan Lewin, neither of which I would be confident with a net. I think that we've probably found our trading partner. Well, the thing is, back at, at the beginning of preseason, I wrote an article, and I, I specifically addressed in that article two teams that might be possible destinations for goaltenders, one of which was San Jose, because they got Nathan Jones, or Martin Jones, and, 
you know, their backup, uh, Staylock isn't very good. And the other team was Buffalo because they're relying on Leonard and their backup's not very good. So the fact that Leonard got hurt just further makes it more feasible that that would be the destination. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sold on Leonard as a starter, but I think for where Buffalo is in their sort of, you know, arc of where the team is now, he's probably fine. But yeah, I think, you know, we're sitting here, like you said, looking at maybe a couple potential markets who are weak, but Buffalo is going to have to do something. I mean, as much as they may want to tank, you can't go with Chad Johnson and, uh, and Lewin as your goalie tandem. Linus Olmark's their third. Still not a great goalie. So there's not going to be a lot of places for them to get to pick up a goalie. There's really nobody good as a UFA still out there. I think you're going to see a deal with Calgary. Yeah, and Buffalo, they're actually kind of sort of trying to go for the playoffs, especially getting guys like Evander Kane and Ryan O'Reilly in there. They already have a good defense core, so they have all the pieces where they, you know, because the East isn't very good compared to the Western Conference, there's a better chance for them to actually make the playoffs. And having them lose their only good goaltender, it makes it more important for them to get somebody in early so that way they're not out of it by the end of the month. And Johnson did surrender four goals last night. But, I mean, Chad, Chad Johnson, I think, is an NHL-caliber backup. He's not a guy I would put a lot of faith in. Yeah, he's the new addition of Joey McDonald. Just somebody that's a good veteran journeyman goaltender that you could throw in there for 10, 20 games a season, and he's not going to really... Destroy yeah, I your think I'd give him more chances, credit than but... uh, than somebody like a Joey McDonald. I almost look at him as like a Scott Clemenson, a guy who is great if he's behind a Martin Brodeur, someone who can suck up you know seventy games a year, and you you never really need to rely on him. But when the starter is not doing well, he can come in and mop up. You know, we've seen those guys throughout time when we've seen you know goalies like Patrick Waugh, Dominic Hasek. Um, Martin Brodeur, they've all had, Cujo even has had backups. Nobody knows who the backup is because the starter takes all the minutes, but you need that one guy who can come in and mop up and be confident that he can do the mop up job. Yeah. It, it's just when you have to rely on him That's as the you're starter, screwed. you're kind of screwed. Yeah. And for two months of the season, like you just can't rely on him being the starter for like 15, 20 games. It, it, right off the bat he's, like, he's the kind of guy you rely on when you have a back-to-back that you know what he can keep you he can keep you from having a blowout in the second game but he's not the guy that you want to play 10 games for you no that's the kind of <laughs> backup that i think we're going to see johnson kind of filling so if you're buffalo and you're calling the flames to try and get a goalie uh what do you think the flames should be asking for in return well Buffalo, they did formerly have a whole bunch of good defensive prospects, but they've graduated most of them or traded a couple off, like Zadorov. Uh, the main area of weakness in the Flames organization is their lack of right shooting right wingers, and Buffalo thankfully has two very good ones in Nick Baptiste and Hudson Fashling. So... <sighs> If the Flames could pry either of them, I don't think, like, it, whether it's Hiller or Ramo, I don't think that those guys in and of themselves is enough to get either of those prospects. But with the Flames having such a large amount of prospect depth in the AHL, they could include somebody or possibly a draft pick like a fourth or a fifth with the goaltender for one See, of those See, the thing guys. I think is going to be tough for us if we try to make a deal with Buffalo and get, let's say, fair market value, if you will. As much as you're right, Buffalo's trying to run for the playoffs, they're still not a great team. I mean, they're not a team that I think anyone predicts is going to be in the playoffs this year. I haven't seen anyone thinking Buffalo's going to make it. And I think Buffalo would almost be fine to sit on the goalies they have and say you know we'll wait two months because we're probably not going anywhere anyways so i don't know that they would be giving up say as much as a team like la might if they lost a goalie or san jose might where they go we need this guy or our playoff chances are shot 
So I think you might get less than market value if you trade him to Buffalo. Possibly, but you also have to look at uh, their draft picks, and they actually have 10 picks already for this upcoming draft. So they might be able to shed a couple in a trade, like say like a third and a fifth, a third or and a fifth, something I think would along be those less lines. Than market value for either of those goalies. I'm not saying you couldn't get a decent return, but if you know if you wake up tomorrow and you read in the paper that uh, Hiller's traded to Buffalo for a third and a fifth, to me that that seems like okay, we got something of value back. I'm not saying we got a terrible deal. It's not like a seventh, but I think it's still below market value. Yeah, it, it is what it is, though. The Flames are in the exact opposite problem of, well, we have three NHL starting goaltenders and no market and to I trade think any you of them. As, as the GM would also have to figure out then, do we want to just take this deal because it's open or do we wait a bit? And I think we can afford to wait a bit if we think we might get a better deal. Yeah, it's one of those things that you don't want to... If you're getting like 80% or more of what you're hoping to get, I think in a situation like this, you just if take it. If we could get a third and a fifth like you suggested, I would do the deal. I think it's not market value, but it's a good enough. But I would hate to see us move, say, uh, Hiller to Buffalo for a fifth. No. Well, of course, then no. I would just hold on to all three of the goaltenders at that rate. You know and, that at some point somebody else is going to end up getting an injury and might pay us more for him. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's going to be interesting, but I definitely think that now we have our sort of our ideal trading partner established. It's just going to be a matter of seeing out if they can work out a deal that works for both of them. Well, moving on from the two games then, why don't we talk a little bit about um, what we're expecting this year for the Flames. We've seen two outings. Um to me, this is the first time that this team has had expectations. We've come for a number of years. We've seen that the Flames have not had any expectations or they've disappointed the expectations they've had. Last year, we expected them to be a terrible team and they surpassed all of our expectations. Do you think that with the high expectations I think Calgary fans have put on the Flames, which I think is probably postseason hockey, they can live up to it this year? Yeah, I do believe so. I think that there's enough leadership in the dressing room that they're not going to just fall apart. Uh, like even in the second intermission last night, apparently Monahan said like we're not losing to these guys, let's step it up. And the Flames came out like gangbusters in the third period and just took it to Vancouver. I don't think that the Flames are going to be the same team where we saw that eight-game losing streak in December. I think that they're going to just keep pushing. And with the increased talent in the organization, I don't see them missing, especially in the Flames division. I think that the off-season moves they make to bring in guys like Froelich, to bring in Hamilton, you know, to bring in these NHL-caliber guys shows us that we're not satisfied not making the playoffs i mean it's not like we said well we need an extra defenseman let's just call up kulak and call it a day like we went out to acquire the pieces we need to be an nhl playoff caliber team and i think that that shows that that's this this organization's goal and that they do have those same expectations of themselves that the rest of us have for them yeah it, it's one of those things that uh, you want to okay we made it to the second round of the playoffs is anybody satisfied with that? No, we want the Stanley Cup. And the only way to do that is to take the next step and push forward in that direction. Will it always be a linear process? No. It, they might step back and they might miss the playoffs this year, but I don't think internally that they're going to go down without a fight. I think they're going to be trying to push Anaheim for the division this year at, as best as they can. And we'll just have to see, especially games against teams like uh, our next contest against St. Louis, where we've struggled against some of those better teams. Can we start beating them with any regularity in the regular season? Yeah, no, for sure. And I think that the Flames are charting a new course right now. I mean, if if you look at teams, they generally have kind of a few stages. You're either rebuilding, 
you're you've rebuilt and you're you know trying to become a regular playoff team or you're one of the top teams in the league. And I think the Flames are really straddling a line we haven't seen before between being both a rebuilding team but also trying to be that playoff ready team. So I don't think there's a formula anymore. We can look at another team and say, well, the Flames are going down this path or they're trying to emulate these guys and so this is what we can expect. And I think that's going to be interesting to see what they do this year in a brand new scenario where they are. They're trying to develop young players and still rebuild, but at the same time, ice a competitive team. Well, not only that, I think they're actually trying to be one of the top teams in the league as well. So it's kind of like being in all three positions all at the same time. And, you know, it's a little bit difficult to be in all three of those positions, but... So if you look at the, I, I agree that they're probably trying to, you know, win the cup if they can. Everybody's trying to win the cup if they can. But if you look at the Calgary Flames on paper, do you think this is a team that we could see in the Western Conference Finals or the Stanley Cup Finals? I honestly, yes, I could. I it it will depend on who they face in the playoffs because you got to figure that we're gonna eventually say we win the first round, we're gonna be playing Anaheim again more than likely. If we can take the strides to actually be able to start beating those good teams, then yes, I could see the Flames actually reach the conference finals or the Stanley Cup. It's just, can they improve against those good teams? Like Part of the reason why the Flames made the playoffs last year was not that they could beat the good teams, but it was their utter domination of everybody else. And, like, in our division, like, I think we swept uh, San Jose, won most of the games against L.A., swept Edmonton, But if you look at last Arizona. year's team on paper, they didn't look like a playoff team. You don't know how guys, like, say, like, a guy like Sam Bennett, how he's going to develop over a course of a year. Like, he might just be an adequate third-line guy for this year, or he might click like Gaudreau did after the first handful of games and become a dangerous scoring threat. Uh, who knows? And it, there's still not enough information to tell whether they're going to be more of a higher-end team or just, you know, in more or less the same position they were last year. I think that the Western Conference Finals would be a uh, good goal for them to strive for. I can't see them playing for the Stanley Cup this year. If I'm being realistic, I think that... Oh, yeah. Same here. Like, I think that they'll have a real hard time beating Anaheim. I think we're going to be out in the second round again this year. Yeah, and I wouldn't be shocked with that either. I think, realistically, we're probably seeing a, you know, second round team. Idealistically, if everything clicks exactly the way we need it to and all the cards line up just perfectly, I think we have a Western Conference team I don't see any scenario in which we play for Lord Stanley's mug at the, at the end of this year. It's one of those things you never know until you get there. It could well, anything, happen, anything but could happen. it I would mean, be Buffalo a surprise. Could be playing for that. Edmonton could be playing for that. But if we're looking realistically, you know, as educated hockey people, can pretty much we can pretty much figure out in advance who's probably going to be a playoff team, who's not. Maybe one or two aren't going to be in there. But of course, anything can happen. I mean, Edmonton could beat us in the playoffs. Yeah, well, the thing is that if we're looking on paper, the Western Conference Finals should be Chicago versus Anaheim once again, because those are the two best teams in each division. I can see Chicago faltering with some of the uh, some of the distractions I think are going to come up around the lawsuit that's going on and that sort of thing. Well, they did get Artemi Panarin, and he's looking really dynamite for Chicago, so that might help to offset some of the distraction. So, we'll see. It's like everything. Who knows until we get there, but in terms of, like, on paper, that would be the guys that I would be penciling in for the West. Yeah, and I mean, of course anything can happen. You know, I'm not trying to jump down your throat, but, you know, oh, we no. can... We could always say, well, who knows, right? But, I mean, if people just wanted to sit on their couch and predict, they wouldn't be listening to us. So I think as educated hockey people, I think we can make a, a realistic prediction, which I think a realistic prediction for this team would be a second-round finish. And I, I think they would give Anaheim a bit more of a hard time than they did last year. But, yeah, I, I think it would be a six or, I think it would be a six or seven-game series against them. 
and you know without a blowout like game one last year but I think it would still be you know uh, the flames coming on the short end of the stick yeah Yeah, we'll see Uh, to me that's my realistic goal for the year yeah Matt is there anyone you think won't be in a flames jersey who is right now at the end of the season let's say uh, the day after trade deadline is there anyone you think is wearing a flaming C that won't be as much as I like him, David Jones. I think that if the Flames are... It would depend largely on how players in Stockton are playing. Like, if you say, like, Marcus Grandland, if he's tearing the AHL a new one, then I could see them just moving Jones out and putting, say, Grandland in his spot. And Jones Jones is coming off a, a year where he had thirty points in sixty seven games. It was a fairly productive year. I mean, if you look at his, you know, year before that for the Flames, he only had seventeen points. So I think he also has some value there. Yeah, it would be sort of like trading Glenn Cross, where yeah, you'd like to keep him, but getting the assets for the player that also a good yeah, thing. Yeah, I think with Glenn Cross there was a bit more of emotion there too because he was somebody that has been with the Flames for a while. I don't think any fans would care either way if Jones is here or not. True, but you know, the Flames also need to be an asset gathering mode still after trading off three picks for Hamilton last year. So, to help offset that, you know, getting at least something for Jones I, I think would help and it's not like the Flames are devoid of talent in Stockton. Like They got like nine guys that could step in in a fourth-line role and be successful, even right we now. We both thought Jones might move last year, too. I think you're right. He's probably the most logical guy, because he is. He has value. It's not like we'd be shipping him out for a seventh or future considerations or just trying to dump the contract. But I think that he is probably the next bubble veteran guy. He's 31. He's got a bigger contract. I think you're right. That's... He's UFA, and I think that somebody could beat him for you know a job. I don't think we're going to get as much of a return as we would from Glenn Cross or anywhere near that. But I think you could definitely get you know a decent, maybe you know second, third round pick, uh, maybe a, an okay prospect, like a yeah, like a third and a fifth or something like that, or you know what I mean, like. And I mean, he might even be a piece that I could see getting thrown in on a goalie deal if we need to up sweeten the pot a little bit. Yeah, it's possible. I'm also going to make a prediction that um, Mason Raymond is not going to be in a Flames jersey come trade deadline. I uh, I don't think he'll be in a Stockton Heat jersey either. I think we may see that uh, Raymond just doesn't cut it again and the Flames move him for something. I don't think there'd be a huge return there, but I I have a feeling that he's not going to be around for much longer. Well, if he continues to play like he did at the end of last season, then I think if the Flames can't, trade them between like now and say june i think the flames would actually use a buyout in his last year of his contract and just you know eat it and i'm just thinking that there's some team out there that if we absorbed half the salary would take him as a throw-in or take him when they get a veteran injury or something like that yeah or like a rebuilding team that could use a veteran guy like say carolina or Arizona or somebody. And as much as he's looked good in the one game he's played this year, I just I can't see it sticking around. Like Raymond, I think has a history of disappointing. Well, you've got to play it by ear and see how it goes. And yeah, it he might turn it around. He might not. I I'm agreeing with you entirely. It's just. And the third guy, I think, who's not going to get traded, but a guy I don't think will end the year on the Calgary roster is Derek England. I think we're going to see Derek England lose his roster spot to a younger defenseman and probably spend part of the year in uh, Stockton. I could see the same thing, but with Ladislav Smead. I think it'll be where, when they're healthy, that like each of them will get a shot, and whoever wins between them will be like the 6-7 guy, and the other one will get shipped out. Yeah, I, I don't know. I have a bad feeling about Smeed. My thought, this is, you know, no, I haven't talked to anybody. I don't have any inside knowledge with how long he's been out and the fact that he might get shipped out. I wouldn't be surprised if Smeed comes back. We find out he's not 100% and he calls it quits. It's possible. Uh, like everything, until he's cleared by the doctors, 
it's a moot You know, point. I think he'll probably end up doing a conditioning stint in the AHL, and maybe we just realize he's lost a step, and he comes back, and they say, you know what, we're just going to buy you out, and he says, I'd rather just retire. Well, I think in that case, you would just be Mark Savard, you know, and just on the IR and well, leave Well, but it I think they'll take him off the IR to see what he's got. That's the thing. Like, I think they'll take him off the IR, send him to a conditioning stint in Stockton because he hasn't been on the ice in so long, and evaluate him after that. Mark Savard never really came off the IR to see what he could do. And I think Smeed at least is owed that much to come off the IR and give him a shot. I agree. So... Anyway, those are names I think uh, we may not see here. On the flip side, Matt, is there anyone who's not currently wearing a Flames? Let's start with a Flames or an Adirondack jersey. Someone who doesn't have a Calgary Flames contract who you think we might see here by the end of the year. Anyone you think they might trade for? Any free agent you think they might bring in? Uh, if the New York Islanders really struggle uh, and are like out of it, I could see the Flames targeting Kyle Ocposo. He's a right-handed right-winger that and he would look really good. He's UFA at the end of the year, but I think a situation like Calgary, I think the Flames would be able to re-sign him. That would pretty much be the only guy that I could see them actively targeting. I think he's only 26 or 27. Yeah, my worry with Ocposo is to bring him in as a rental might cost us too much. Yeah, you'd have to be fairly confident that you could re-sign him. Like I, I wouldn't pull the deal in, unless like you could sign him for like say a six six deal or something like that. Yeah, and I think you'd, uh, even then I think even if you think you can sign him, I might almost try my chances to just get him on July first and give up nothing. It, it would depend on where the Islanders are and where the Flames are. If it makes sense, then by all means pull the deal. If not, then don't obviously. What about anyone who's currently wearing a Stockton Heat jersey who you think is going to earn a full-time spot this year? I I would have to go with Marcus Granlund. I think he looked really good in preseason, and he looked good again uh, yesterday in the Stockton game. I think he's on the verge of being a full-time NHLer. It's just that they, the Flames need to move a veteran so that way he has a spot and that's why i think like once jones gets traded if he does get traded that will be the player that he spot that he takes yeah i agree with you i like granlin and i think granlin has an nhl body of work where we know what we're getting with him so i would not be surprised if he ends the season here not like you know oh we're calling him up after the deadline just to play 10 games i think he's going to be here by like december and earn a roster spot yeah, and I think, like, starting next season, I think he's a full-time NHL player, like, until the Flames either trade him or he plays himself out of position. Yeah, I think Granlin's just a victim of numbers this year. I think he's ready to be. He's just a victim of numbers and not having a yeah, spot. Yeah, and with his weight, n not having to clear waivers, I think that's why he's in Yeah, Stockton. it's more of a business decision than a hockey decision. Yeah, like if he had to clear waivers, I think he's here to start the year and Raymond's in Stockton right now. And that's the other thing that could happen too, is Raymond could get sent down and Granlin could be brought up. I could see that happening, you know, in the next couple of weeks here. Well, Matt, let's move on from the Calgary Flames. I think we've probably talked as much as we can about them in their two games. And let's uh, go south to Stockton and talk about what's happening there. Uh, Stockton Heat have announced their final roster. Uh, their roster is a 28-man roster. They have two goalies, eight defensemen, and 18 forwards. The roster has 11 players with previous NHL experience, and 21 of the 28 are signed to NHL contracts. Um, interesting name to note on there is kind of looking through the AHL contracts. Colden Orr has been signed. Uh, not a guy you kind of expect to be your developmental team guy, but do you think he's anything more than just a grinder? Yeah, with the division that the Stockton Heat are in, a lot of the other teams have heavyweight fighters. So having a guy like Orr there is just a deterrent. So like, don't even think about running around and hurting our guys. You know, we've got a deterrent there. And that's pretty much the only 
reason why he's there, and I'd only expect him to play against those specific teams. Yeah, and I mean, we had McGratton there last year in that role. Yeah, and Trevor Gillies. So, I think uh, between Riley and Orr, that that position is filled entirely. Um, any any surprises when you look at the Adirondack roster and when your surprise made the team? No, we don't. We also don't know what's going to happen with ECHL assignments because they're still a bit heavy on uh, probably a couple forwards and maybe a defenseman. But anyone you're surprised got uh, made the HL roster? No, not really. It looks about the way I expected it to. I'm still a little bit surprised that Kent Simpson is the backup. I'm still a little bit disappointed they didn't go out and find a veteran there, but. If you look around, there's not a lot of veterans to be had. Yeah, well, Kent Simpson still has potential. Like, he's only 23, and he didn't look terrible in the when he was with uh, Chicago's uh, farm system. The Blackhawks just happened to have, like, five or six really good goaltenders at the time, and so they let him go, they let Ranta go, I just don't know that he's going to get the chance that you'd need to see that backing up a guy like Gillies. Well, even if he only plays like 15 games or so, say by the end of the year, you'll get to know enough about him to see if there's something more there or not. But, it, you know, it it's like anything. You try a guy with some potential... If he doesn't do anything, you got Mason McDonald, who's likely going to be coming in next year to back up. So, worst case scenario is you just let him go at the end of the year. And if he does show something, then perhaps you start McDonald in the ECHL and go on from there. Yeah, you never know. From what I've seen of Simpson, um, he seems like he's a guy who takes up a lot of the net. He knows how to use his size. He's six foot two, very well. And he also is a guy who's smart with angles. Every time I've seen him play, he seems like he really makes shooters try to beat him straight on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't think it's a bad move. I guess I was just kind of expecting they'd go in a bit of a different direction. But we'll see what happens there. Yeah. And uh, the Stockton Heat have played one game. They opened their season on October 10th. And, of course, not... Thanksgiving weekend in the States. They played against the Rockford Ice Hogs, which is the uh, HL affiliate for the Chicago Blackhawks. And the Stockton Heat ended up with a 7 nothing win over the Ice Hogs, which really when you think about the, the team being the Blackhawks affiliate, you'd think that there's probably more talent there. But great showing by the Stockton Heat. You watch the game. What are your thoughts? It's one of those rare times where the 7 nothing score was actually flattering to Rockford. Uh, they could have easily given up more to the point where it could have been like a 14 or 15 goal game for how many opportunities that Stockton received. There was at least five breakaways that the Flame or the Heat did not score on and all, probably about 10 or so two-on-ones that just didn't connect. I don't know what was going on with Rockford, but the, their whole defensive system was complete crap. Uh, it was, looked like the Calgary Flames were playing the Calgary Royals, and both teams were going hard at it. That's how much of a separation there was. Like, it was not even the same planet in terms of level of play. And, like, Rockford started um, Michael Leeton, who, if you look at Leeton, he's been around for a while. He has a lot of HL experience. I'd say he's a pretty, you know, senior and pretty f familiar goalie with the HL level. And they yanked him less than 15 minutes into the game. He had four goals against in the first 15 minutes. Like, that's a, ter that's a terrible showing from your veteran goalie. And honestly, I can't blame either of the goalies for any of the goals. They did not give up a single bad goal. It's just that the whole team in front of them was non-existent. Put it this way, Gillies got the 19-save shutout. 17 of those saves I could have made, or you could have made, or anybody standing in front of the net could have made. That's how, like, they were all point shots, like, distant shots that you can just easily glove down. Like, there was no... The, the first actual scoring opportunity didn't come until, like, five minutes left in the second period. 
it it was just a complete mismatch. That's crazy. So for those that are interested, the starting lineup for Stockton in that game, uh, we had obviously John Gillies Ned who picked up the shutout. We had Jakob Nakladal and Tyler Wilson on defense. And Kenny Agostino, Drew Shore, and Marcus Granlin started as our forwards. Um, and it, really, when you look at that, that's a that's a pretty good starting lineup for an AHL team. Yeah. Uh, for me, the best players for the Flames or the Heat, I mean, um, amongst the defensemen, uh, Jakob Nakladal had a really excellent game. He kept firing point shots, especially on the power play, and he was getting them through, and that actually led to two of the goals for Stockton in the first period. It was actually the same goal, really, he was basically in the middle of the ice surface and just fired a point shot, and Arnold tipped the first one, Granlin tipped the second one. It was actually kind of bizarre. You'd have to act, felt like just, you know, hitting the replay button, like, was it the exact same play? It worked before. Let's try it again. Yeah, and Oliver Shillington had a really strong game didn't make any defensive mistakes, and he scored a nice goal where he just stepped in from the blue line and just ripped one right past the goaltender. Lighton didn't even move. That's how, like, it was already by him by the time he actually reacted. Nacladol's wearing number 33, and he got three points in the game, a goal and two assists, and Shillington, if you watch them, you'll see wearing number four, and he got a goal and assist, but... Really, when you look down the roster, I mean, pretty much everybody got a point. The only guys who got nothing were uh, Watherspoon, Stevenson, uh, Klimchuk, and Blair, and Hunter Smith. Yeah. Up front, the players that had the best games were uh, Bill Arnold, which isn't a shock. Doesn't surprise me. Marcus, yeah, Marcus Granlin. Again, doesn't surprise me. The two guys who are probably competing for the NHL job this year. Yeah, in addition to them, Kenny Augustino made quite a few smart, heady plays. He made a nice between-the-legs pass to Tyler Watherspoon on the Drew Shore goal. Just very solid, didn't make any blaring mistakes at any point. And Emile Poirier had his best game all, like, since Penticton. He actually was starting to make passes that were connecting and was able to receive them and have it stay on his stick, so that was good. The only players that struggled in the game were Drew Shore and uh, Hunter Smith. Shore had about 12 to 14 prime scoring chances that he flubbed in the game. Like uh, That's where the score could have been like 14 or 15. And most of the chances that were flubbed were from Drew Shore. He had, I think, three breakaways. He did end up scoring a goal in the game, but he could have easily had a hat trick or more if he wasn't fighting it. And Drew Shore's not a guy to expect to be struggling, but it's only one game. You never know what's going on. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things that, like uh, Raymond where it, he just had a bit of a weak camp got sent down takes a little bit mentally to get back into it yeah he just needs to like raymond to snap out of whatever funk he's in yeah and i think he'll definitely turn around i don't think we're going to be talking about him you know being a sore spot all season i would imagine within the first two three games he gets his legs under him and gets going oh for sure it it's just he has to start like playing well enough where I need to take a spot, not I'm just an AHL guy. Because he's getting up there where you might need to move him out of the organization entirely if he doesn't start showing that he can play in the NHL. Well, as we talked about last year, I think this is a defining year for him where he's going to decide that for himself. Is Am I a career AHL guy or am I a you know guy who's gunning for an NHL job? And I think that Drew is the only guy that can decide that based on what he does this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, last piece of Stockton news is they finally named their leadership team on the ice. Aaron Johnson was named captain, and wearing the A's are going to be uh, Turner Elson, Garnet Hathaway, and Blair Riley. Um, to me, no shock with the captain. He's the most senior guy. He's the veteran. Makes sense. 
I'm a little bit surprised that we didn't see a guy like um, like Bill Arnold or maybe a guy like Granlin wear an A, but I think it's probably just because those guys, we don't know how long they're going to be there. They don't want to give them an A. Yeah, uh, that's pretty much it. Like, you don't typically see guys that are on the verge of getting recalled getting letters just for that reason. But I think that Aaron Johnson's a logical choice for captain. What about you? Yeah, it's the same like with Nolan Yonkman last year where he's just there as a veteran guy and if the Flames run into a huge amount of injuries, he might get a recall. But The day that we have to call Aaron Johnson up with this roster is the day that we know we're in trouble. Yeah. I think you got five or six defensemen down at that point. Well, that's it. I mean, I'd probably even give the spot to someone like, uh, you know, Kulak first, who, okay, at least he's a young guy who's kind of earned, or sorry, Kalkin. We've already given it to Kulak, but someone like Kalkin, who you say, okay, you know, he's a young guy, he's paid his dues, let's give him a shot. Um, it, yeah, I think you might even see Shillington up before well, that's it. <laughs> Yeah, any, any of those young guys. I think if we have to call Aaron Johnson up, we're probably uh, having a very different conversation about where this team's going to be at the end of the year. Yeah. Matt, any other Flames or Heat news you want to talk about? No, just looking ahead to uh, next week to see how both these teams do. Uh, what have we got for the Heat? What's their schedule looking like? Do you know? I think they play just one game on Wednesday. And with the with the Flames, um, we'll do our weekly predictions as we always do. Last week, we both made predictions. We both thought that they were going to win in Vancouver, um, but you ended up getting the you ended up going the week and getting the uh, I guess the win because I thought they could get a point against the Canucks in Calgary, and you didn't. So you guessed that they'd walk away from the week with two points, and I thought three. So good for you. It had more to do with uh, how they played against the Jets in the last home preseason game. That's the reason why I thought they were going to struggle against Vancouver in the opener, because they just didn't look quite composed. Yeah, but I, I was really hoping at least that we would see, you know, they were in the dome, they had the home opener, I thought it would just fire them up. I think, like, the Flames haven't won the home opener in, like, six years or something like that. It's not a so. good thing. So this week coming in, uh, we start on Tuesday with a home game against our, I, I wouldn't say our nemesis, but a team that we struggle with quite a bit over the last couple of years, the St. Louis Blues at the Dome. Then they get a couple of days off and they have back-to-backs. Friday, we travel to Winnipeg to take on the Jets, and Saturday, we're back home against the Oilers. With six points on the table, how do you think we do, Matt? I'm going to go with four, and I think that the Flames will beat St. Louis, uh, I They have struggled against them, but I think that the Flames need to prove that they can actually beat the good teams. And St. Louis has pretty much walked all over Calgary every meeting for like the last four years. So I think that that's the number one team on their list outside of the Ducks to, okay, this team's really handled us. We got to find a way to be able to beat this team. So I think they will come out gunning even more so to take on St. Louis. I think they'll drop the Jets game, and I think they'll beat the Oilers. Hmm. Yeah, I, th- I think the Oilers have given two points for us uh, this week. I was going to say four. I'm looking, though. I think we're, I think as much as you're right, we're probably going to uh, – we want to beat St. Louis. I think coming off – the first two games, I don't know that the play is up to where it needs to be to beat the Blues this early. I'm going to say... F- I know we're going to beat the Oilers. I'm going to say that we're going to get four points, but I think we're going to do it differently than you thought. I think we're going to drop the game to... I think we might get a one point if we're lucky. We might get one point if we're lucky against the, the Jets, and I think we're going to beat the Oilers. So I think... I'll just call it that we're going to lose to St. Louis. We're going to get one point against the Jets, and we're going to get two against the Oilers. Okay. So I'll go three points, you go four. It's one of those things I think we can get a point in either one of the first two games, but not both. I think we have to drop one. It's just a matter of which one. Yeah. Well, you could even go with four points, and we could just do the tiebreaker being which one of us is correct. (laughs) All right, let's do that. We'll both go four points. We'll see which, which game the Flames win. 
Yeah, and it's a tie if we beat both St. Louis and Winnipeg and lose to Edmonton. There you go. Yeah, if if we lose to Edmonton, I think we we both have to uh, have to sit in the corner and think about what what we've done. I think if we lose to Edmonton, we're not the only ones that are in trouble. I think if if the Flames, who are you know contending to be a second round playoff team, lose the first match to Edmonton, I think that there's some uh, some hard thinking that has to be done. Yeah. So there's our there's our. Points for the week, we're going to both sit at four. Um, you've taken the early lead, which is good, and we'll see how that goes. And I think it's going to be a fun week to see those games because I think that they're all going to be – even the Edmonton game, I think Edmonton is going to be fight Tougher yeah, this I, year. Yeah, and I think but... that in their first match especially, they really want to come out and show us that they're a force to be reckoned with. So I think that's going to be a fun game to watch. I don't think it'll be like Edmonton games in the past where it's like, wow, this is just terrible hockey. Yeah, well – Plus the Oilers, they're probably going to be dropping their first four games because I, I, if I recall correctly, they're playing Dallas and then Minnesota. So and I don't see how they beat either of those teams. So they're going to be wanting to get off the schneid eventually. <laughs> so Yeah, they play uh, their next two games are Dallas and then St. Louis and then Calgary. Oh, yeah. I know they play Minnesota at some point in the next couple weeks, but yeah. Just not good. They're gonna have a real tough time of it. Like especially with the like if you look at the Oilers' schedule for this month, like the, there's a possibility that they only win like two games. Well, let's so. not let us be one of those two. Exactly. And before we leave, um, an announcement we'll make to everybody. By the time you hear this show, you should see that our new FiresideChat.ca website has been launched. This is something that I've been working on along with Matt all summer long. Um, the current website we just outgrew. It was designed for when the show was much smaller, when we had a lot less content, and we really took a look at the site and what we're doing and said, we need a better presentation of this content. So we won't talk too much about it. We'll let you guys explore it. But if you go to firesidechat.ca, you'll find that it's easier to find the game previews. You'll find it's easier to get the latest news, the latest uh, articles, and the last podcast episode right from the main page. So we encourage you guys all, if you haven't been in a while, to go to firesidechat.ca and see what we're up to. And if you are a regular uh, viewer of the website, hopefully you'll find the new format to be a lot easier to use. And the new website uh, design and layout and some of the structure we've put in is going to allow us to unveil some new features that we want to add to the show, some new ways to get you guys involved and some stuff that we want to do this year. So we'll talk more about some of those next week, but uh, this site allows us to kind of expand the show in a direction that Matt and I have wanted to go for a few years, um, but just haven't had the capability to do. So we'll unveil some of that stuff in the coming weeks, but we hope that you guys enjoy the site and uh, we... We've been working a long time on it, and we're quite proud of it, so we hope everyone likes what we've got there. So, Matt, let's get out of here and go enjoy the Jays game, and we'll talk to you after the three games this week and see how the Flames have done. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good week. Talk to you later. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.